this is Dr. Saurabh Banerjee. Uh, on behalf of School of Pharmaceutical Management, I welcome you all for this very important webinar, which is focused on the orientation to the international pharmaceutical business. I have the privilege and honor to welcome our speaker for today, Mr. Webhav Sharma ji. Uh, Mr. Webhav, uh, many, many thanks for you know, joining us and accepting our invitation. Uh, so welcome to this uh, webinar and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to read a brief profile of Mr. Webhav Sharma ji. Thank you, sir. Mr. Webhav Sharma ji is working as a general manager in as a in international business development and sales in Cadilla Pharmaceuticals Limited based at Ahmedabad. Uh, he has a vast experience of more than 10 years and he has worked with many of the uh, international and uh, nationally acclaimed pharmaceutical organizations to name a few LG Life Sciences, Centis Pharmaceuticals, Jubilant Life Sciences. Uh, he has, uh, he's basically dealing with the international business development and sales in Cadilla Pharmaceuticals. Uh, I'm, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to say that uh, Webovji is a pass out of IHMR from the batch of 2007-9 and we are proud to have uh, Webovji with us. And regarding his uh, education qualification, he's a B.Tech in biotechnology. So uh, with these few words, uh, so the, today, today's the topic which we have chosen uh, is on the international pharmaceutical business. So uh, friends, I would like to uh, you know, share with you that as the domestic pharmaceutical market is being saturated and uh, people are uh, finding a you know, lot of ways to get out of this domestic saturated market. So venturing into the international pharmaceutical business is a uh, option which the people are look out. But the to carry out a business in the international pharmaceutical arena is a quite a tough and lot of uh, expertise has to be uh, known in this particular area regarding new product identification how do you know launch the product pre launch activities how do you uh, carry out the launch plan how do you carry out the regulatory framework how do you carry out the supply chain activities so when you take these things on an international context, they are very difficult to, you know, handle these things and you need a lot of expertise in this thing. Mr. Webber is an expert in this thing and uh, uh, I would like to request Mr. Webber ji to uh, throw some light on this important aspect of the international pharmaceutical business. Mr. Webber, the dice is yours and uh, you, you can, you know, start your discussion, please, sir. Thank you so uh, much. Th thanks, Dr. Saurabh, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to interact. Uh, and uh, it's basically the best use of time sharing the experience. And this is something which everyone aspires to be getting reassociated with the uh, college from where the students uh, where we started and sharing some of the experience. Right, sir. Thank you so uh, much. So I would like to start. I've created uh, a small slide deck. Uh, as uh, you all know, that international business is a very vast area. So... Uh, uh, I think Dr. Saurabh has laid out the foundation of uh, what are the uh, essentials of international business because uh, launching a product, identifying a new product is one of the uh, uh, first step uh, towards a successful international business. So I've created a slide deck uh, and I would like to share and take you all uh, participants to this. And uh, the methodology which I have, uh, I would like to uh, take on uh, the slide is more on the case study. And these case studies are based on uh, how the companies have performed. And it is amalgamation of what has happened in the market and some of the learnings through which we, uh, which is transpired through the experience and from the, uh, my experience and from the experience of the industry leaders. So I would like to share a screen now. Uh, yes, please. Sir. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, I have narrowed down the topic, uh, which was, uh, uh, which uh, we decided is the strategies for successful international business. As Dr. Saurabh laid the foundation that with the saturations on domestic uh, uh, market, 
every company is aspiring to build on to the international business so it poses uh, an opportunity for the indian companies however at the same time it has its own challenges in understanding the international business every market behaves in a different sense every market has its own challenges however if we uh, take a, a common uh, understanding and uh, looking you know uh, screen out most of the challenges the common challenge and which is one of the most important step uh, out of the uh, total gamut and total uh, attributes for the successful international business is the new product identification which is first step towards the international business the next thing uh, is uh, once you have identified uh, uh, you know new product how it fits into the opportunity which is available in the market uh, and it includes both you know it has happened in past in india uh, in the domestic market and also it is uh, it is one of the essential elements of the international business the another is uh, how to launch products so few i would like to take the help of the case studies few successful launches which has happened so that we all have certain learnings out of it uh, some uh, these are the uh, these are the case studies which have been uh, the successful uh, in the market some so the idea is we should have uh, by the end of the webinar we should have certain learnings so that and some thought provoking idea so that we sh we can inculcate those ideas and learnings in the our day to day uh, operations and day to day strategies uh, starting with the presentation now coming to the uh, first part of it what new product identification so uh, this is based on my experience in uh, working with the uh, multinationals and the national the basics of new product identification is uh, we should start with what is the role of a new product uh, when uh, we think of any new product what is the role of a new product in the overall growth and strategy uh, when it comes to the uh, a strategic business unit or it, if it comes to the company level how you think uh, this new product adds a value to your overall growth strategies there are different roles of new products some company uh, some uh, new products add to the modest growth role some uh, adds to the high growth role and just and there are certain new products which are just for the survival so and according to the uh, the dif differentiation in terms of the aspirations of your growth the new products uh, selection uh, criteria are different for example if you are looking at survival role uh, as a part of your strategy for the new product then you are looking at uh, a me too product plan uh, when when we say a me too it's basically a generic uh, plan so for example i have an established presence in antibiotics market i just want to have one uh, of the additional products so as so to have a complete product basket so when my uh, sales representative goes to a doctor he has a product in this uh, to detail out so he doesn't miss any opportunity when the company or a strategic business unit looks at a modest growth then the basket uh, Uh, he is looking at a basket approach, which is a mix of a me too, which is a plain generic, what we call also as a vanilla generic, and a differentiated product. So when when we say a differentiated product, it's basically a, a incremental modification of product. For example, I have in the market a plain uh, product, and then I'm adding uh, an extended release, sustained release, or delayed release product, which is which. piggy banks on the established product which is there available in the market but however if you are looking at a high growth then it's a uh, it's a different ball game you are looking at proactive approach wherein you would understand go deep into the market you are looking at differentiated and of course the innovative approach so your me to uh, uh, your me your vision from a me to product from just a being a survival in the market to the high growth your approach changes now according to the uh, the category where you want to play in they it includes a blueprint and i think this is something which uh, uh, is uh, i have practiced in my 10 years of experience 
looking at drafting the blueprint for the new products uh, when I was heading the portfolio for Centis Pharma. The role of new products, which I've explained, the budget estimate. So you cannot, a company cannot have all the products looking at a high growth because of the budget constraints. And even everything calls for the capital investment. For example, uh, when I was in Centis, there were certain suspensions uh, wherein um, if you even want to develop a, a me too product, a generic, you need to bring on the innovation uh, on just keeping the particle size. So you need a specific equipment which calls for the capex involvement. So you cannot have all the new products looking at high growth. So if uh, you have to mix and match on your new product criteria, then of course the sales and the profit volume, and then the most important thing is uh, setting up a benchmarks for the new product performance. Now, what it means is, so if you look at the uh, multinationals, they say that the new products contributes to 20% of their revenue. Some companies in generics, they say the 5% of their revenue comes from the new product. So what is the benchmark you're looking at? So that according to the benchmark, you can mix match and play on uh, the new products roles and uh, identify those opportunities accordingly. The basics of, uh, you know, uh, qualifying uh, and analyze uh, the attractive opportunities is at a therapy level is looking at the size of a market, growth rate of uh, the markets which you are targeting, looking at the competition, the basics, uh, you know, the most important thing which I believe is uh, compatibility with your existing product lines, manufacturing facilities and marketing capability. And this is something which uh, uh, I think a lot of companies are also struggling at this moment. For example, if you look at uh, Indian companies, uh, they have a new product in their pipeline. However, once uh, it, 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 it uh, matures in the development phase, you, they start looking out for the CMO opportunity because they realize that they cannot manufacture this in-house. And that uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, brings your business case to the lower end and then your struggle starts. So looking at the manufacturing facilities and also the marketing capabilities, we cannot do everything uh, by ourselves. So we have to look and build upon our strengths. The yeah, another is the degree of newness. And that is something which uh, is uh, what I believe, which is one of the most essential idea is how much newness you want to bring in, in your product. And that is something which builds your uh, marketing strategy and that's how you differentiate yourself. So you need to understand everything. Now, building on to uh, what uh, is uh, the new product identification is, uh, uh, this is a standard practice when I was in LG Life Sciences. Uh, when the earlier part you have done at a therapy at a category level. However, when you go deep dive into uh, at a product level, there's something that as a concept development. So you have to sit with your marketing team, market research team and understand what is this problem statement and how my new product, which I'm massaging is uh, would solve the purpose. What is an unmet need, which I think my new product would add on. An unmet need could be uh, a patient compliance, could be just, uh, uh, you know, even adding a flavor so that, you know, uh, my, if, if my target audience is a pediatric, they would stick and would take the medicine and adds on to the patient compliance. So a brief description of a need of this product and so that the product attributes would uh, address to the solution. Now, once this concept statement is developed, you have to screen the concept. Now, when you say you screen the concept, can my sales force handle this product once it would be out in the market? So for example, uh, uh, I have developed a new flavor in my suspension product, which is for the pediatric segment, but do my sales force would be able to uh, in cash on the differentiation, which I want to bring on to the market, would they, uh, add on uh, to what the development I have uh, created. So it has to be a holistic approach. You cannot work in a silos, 
saying that the new product identification team uh, or the product portfolio team, uh, which we say in the Indian market, uh, works differently with the market research team and the market teams who have to market the product and the existing channel. So I have my strength in Rx. For example, if you look at uh, the recent acquisitions of Unicam uh, by Torrent, so uh, the Torrent, the, so Unicam has the products uh, which was this uh, charcoal based uh, product. So the product is primarily an OTC product. So uh, Unicam has a strength in developing a product which was of more of an OTC segment. So, however, they sold out to some bigger company who have its own strength in those markets. For example, Wallonie is one of the great examples. So Renbaxi developed it and then later on they add on to the existing channels and they created a, 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 a big team out of it. So you need to have a balance and understanding right from the beginning on what your sales team could handle and what are the existing channels which are available so that later on you should not uh, uh, work on a firefighting mode. Then of course the business analysis uh, in most of the Indian companies and international we all so say it a business case uh, which includes the sales volume, the profit potential, you look at the financial values, the ROI, NPV, uh, payback time. So, you know, the, every promoter will look at, uh, look at, you know, how early I can get my reven, uh, revenues uh, on the cost which I have incurred on the project. One of the most important part uh, when you're looking at high investment uh, new products is the marketing testing and research with the KOLs. You cannot work and that's how a, a, a commodity market differentiates from the pharma because our customers, our, our doctors, our KOLs, we have to work in sync with do my product, uh, the concept which I have built around it. I have screened the concept. However, is it in line with my KOLs? Uh, understanding or the KOL's perception. So, and accordingly, then the product has the proposal has to go down to the product development at an R&D level. And accordingly, once the product is developed, the marketing plans and marketing strategies sh should be developed. Moving on to the next important part of the marketing strategy is positioning. Uh, I'm just only touching it. Uh, uh, basically for the two reasons. One is uh, we should always as a team uh, have a position of the product which is in the uh, development stage and how we would differentiate this product in the market once it would be out. It has to be thoroughly done and it has to be an uh, over time, a model has to be created, which has to be a sustainable over time against the competition. It should not be that it should uh, answer your uh, gap or the unmet need for small period of time. Positioning has to be sustainable over time. Your differential advantage has to be sustainable. Few of the ground rules which I have understood over my experience is you cannot appeal to everyone. For example, if I say that I will develop a product and it would encourage the general physician, the specialist, all one, even the farm at a pharmacy level, I cannot touch each and every corner of the squares at a, at any given point of time. You cannot beat everyone and that's one of the ground rules. For example, if I want to launch an anti-acid in India, I cannot replace Jellucil or I cannot uh, replace Digene uh, at this point in time. I could see some of the questions. Uh, I would be very pleased to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Yes, we'll, we'll answer this question at the end. No problem. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, I hope we are clear with uh, this as of now. It's going on very fine, very fine. Yeah. Very fine. Now, uh, I talked about uh, how to do the new product identification and how to drill down till the product level. What are the basic aspects of new product we should look into? However, what is a new product uh, definition? What are the categories of new products? What are the types of new products? So. If you want to, uh, if I would like to differentiate in terms of the new product, I would try to segregate in uh, the four categories. One is go for gold. These, this category of new products are the products which have a strong differentiation 
from the competing products. These are the products uh, are the products uh, in the category which are which have a high perceived burden. For example, diabetics in India, antihypertension, so which are well entrenched markets uh, with lot of competition. However, you are looking at a new product which has which offers you a completely strong differentiation. For example, Genuvia, Cetagliflin. So when it was launched, it offers a differentiation which through which you can replace replace the existing sulfonyl ureas tzs uh, clearly avastin uh, one of the one of the greatest launch uh, and one of the leading molecules across the globe so on this the perception which you want to create in a market is that your high quality will guarantee high sales volume so if you have the strong differentiation you have to back it with the high quality which uh, uh, which nobody could challenge and that is a guarantee for the high sales volume however uh, looking at the flip side of it it requires substantial resources uh, in terms of when you say resources in terms of the cost in terms of the manpower in terms of the time taken for uh, developing these there are certain products which uh, uh, moving on to the next is what i call is stand out from the crowd most of the product if you look around in your domestic market are the part of this category which is stand out from the crowd now uh, these are moderately differentiated in a well established disease area when i'm saying this uh, these are launches uh, primarily like i have an uh, an oral product and i'm launching a product in an iv form uh, i have a product well established and i'm and i'm launching uh, an extended release a sustainable release a delayed release to address to one of the few uh, unmet needs of the market uh, to gain the market share these launches should be positioned effectively and create a clear differentiation in the market uh category creator these uh, this category is uh, uh, a market wherein uh, you have to establish an unmet need there is an unmet need but you have to establish it you have to access to the target population the finest example i can think of on this is uh, gardasil so uh, the gardasil was launched by merck and it was for uh, unestablished uh, human papilloma virus market which was now uh, what we named cervical cancers so this market does not exist uh, earlier it was created by merck by uh, introduce when they started working on this molecule and they build this fabulous market however look at this that uh, the cases of the cervical cancers were the prevalence is what we call in epidemiology is highest in india however the market which was chosen for the first launch of this product was not india they have chosen uh, europe they have chosen us for the obvious reason however uh, so your access to the targeted population is very important that's the point i am highlighting that in india even though the prevalence is high but uh, looking at the cost of therapy was not one of the premier targeted market for gardasil launch then the the next category is a market presents uh, Uh, this is based on uh, primarily when if you look into the generic market which is like a uh, uh, us market you launch certain products in uh, in the established or unestablished market which are undifferentiated products uh, just because you want uh, to have a product in that category you want to take some market share by offering a price differential so these this is something of uh, a survival growth strategy so broadly a new product can be classified into the, these four categories now coming to the case study so uh, we have understood the new product identification we have understood what are the new products now i want to take you all uh, through a few of the case studies uh, on how the uh, the companies have worked on the new products and how they worked on a pre launch and a launch uh, you may have faltered on a new product selection but you have to build around once it's launched in the market so how the companies have done it uh, ranging from uh, a well established understanding a market creating a market 
to a market wherein the new products have been uh, are launched and they have not performed well but the companies have built up a market uh this is a uh, a typical case study which uh, i have uh, gone through from one of my industry uh, veteran when i joined uh, panacea biotech uh, he gave me this example and i'm uh, sharing it uh, so it was of year 1976 in india uh, there was a company called uh, sarabhai chemicals uh, in baroda uh, one of the fine uh, uh, pharma company uh, which we now uh, are not even aware of so in 1976 uh, antibacterial for the obvious reason was one of the largest and fastest growing segment that time it was around 395 crores sarabhai chemicals was uh, one of the number one pharmaceutical company that time uh, for this antibacterial market eight out of the 11 brands of their portfolio were among top 120 brands in india the if you look at the segment of their product portfolios at that point in time for the antibacterial was uh, narrow spectrum oral penicillins which accounts for the 40% of the total antibiotic sales in india uh the market share was healthy 28% however that was a point in indian market wherein the there was a market shift which was happening uh wherein uh, the market was shifting from narrow spectrum to the potent broad spectrum from a natural antibiotics uh, to the semi synthetic antibiotics and the products were amoxicillin cephalosporins the phenomenal growth was seen uh, over over 80% since 1970 share was 21 to 44% now what happened uh, actually is uh, the narrow spectrum from 1976 to 88 uh, from 28% Was shifted to twenty one percent. So what has happened? The antibacterial market grew by forty percent. The narrow spectrum in that forty percent they just grew from the study in the study period of seventy six to eighty eight. They declined to twenty percent from earlier forty percent. And the newer antibot uh, antibiotics, which was from broad spectrum potent, they grew by eighty percent in the market share. So what has happened? So Sarabhai lost. Uh, from 28% to 1%. So, which company uh, uh, took the opportunity uh, and filled the gap? So, it was Rinbaxy, and that was one of the uh, finest entry of Rinbaxy into the segment. Rinbaxy ranked 30th, volume five, only five crores in 1976, become fourth ranked, 59 crores revenue in 98. so from 5 crores it grew by 59 59 crores the renbaxi entered every sub segment of newer potent broad spectrum antibiotics so whatever uh, new uh, amoxicillin cephalosporin products that were uh, being launched by innovators they copy those molecules they studied those molecules and entered with their own products Identify fastest growing subsegment, which was Kinelon, launch Sifran, which is uh, even today uh, one of the leading uh, known brand to us. Then Baxi captured 12.57 percent of total antibacterial sales in 1990, and Sarabhai lost it, and they shrink their market share to only 6.7 percent. That is, this gives us a clear example of what I was saying is market opportunity analysis. You have to understand. what is happening where the shift is going and you have to encash and build your new product identification strategy accordingly another few examples uh, we all know natco pharma uh, uh, one of the good companies and now one of the growing companies uh, versus bear so this was a ca case which uh, actually is a case study uh, where in one company uh did not work on the product development in a, a you know in natural way they studied the loopholes in the existing system came up with the concept of compulsory licensing opportunity and uh, draw their r&d efforts towards it you know align uh, the concept of uh, you know ip intellectual property and how you can use the intellectual property in a best way to build up your portfolio 
and this was the case which uh, you know uh, taken over by companies like hetero uh, and i even me personally faced uh, one of such uh, uh, you know uh, case wherein uh, we were the innovators in lg we could not launch the product because of the compulsory licensing uh, case which won by hetero uh, so it's an compulsory licensing for example the bear uh, they uh, got the product uh, Three lakh cost therapy. They go to uh, Natco, went to the government, saying that it's a high cost uh, of the drug. We cannot launch uh, because of which a lot of population cannot have an access to such a fabulous product. They got the licensing. They fought the case, and what they got is uh, they bring down the cost from three lakh uh, lakh cost therapy to eighty eight hundred eight thousand eight hundred for the monthly dose. uh plus in addition the 6% royalty to the bear for the net sales and uh with uh you know uh, you know meeting all the customer meeting 600 patients every year and that's how they built on uh, their new product portfolio you know in cashing a very niche area which was unexploited at that point in time you know finding gaps where they can uh, look into the big molecules and how they can use their scientific acumen to address uh, uh, the gap which is available in the market very fine example uh, which i want to take is pfizer biologically in lupin the story of anti tb market uh, and uh, in cadilla i am also uh, this is uh, one of the example which uh, we generally talk about in 1972 india is the one of the major markets of anti tb we all know uh, for the obvious reason in that time 1972 the major molecules was uh, amino salicylic acid isoniazide acetazone pfizer and biological e were the acknowledged market leaders in 1980 there was a new molecule the thambutol the fampicin pyrazine which were launched from leadership position in 1970 uh, from the study period from in 1980 uh, the, the, Ma Pfizer lost the market share. Now, what really happened? Let me take you all through this. Lupin entered this market. Their revenue was three crores in nineteen eighty one sixty two. They got into this new molecules. They developed the generics out of it. They worked on uh, what we say two FDCs, three FDCs, and even to the four FDCs by nineteen nineties and two thousand of uh, anti TB molecule, which gained the market share. So they. Moved to twelfth rank from sixty-two, grew their revenue from three crores to thirty-three crores, and gained the. And they were genuinely the thirty percent, uh, the market leader with thirty percent market share in this, which grew to the fifty percent market share in nineteen ninety. In Cadilla, uh, I still market uh, a few of the. Uh, uh, when we entered the NTTB, we started with isoniazide, thambutol. and then we worked on the two fdcs and fdcs three fdcs and luckily this legacy of lupin was uh, then taken over by macleods they they developed the apis mixed it with their own formulation unit and we in cadilla uh, uh, we waited till the end uh, because we know uh, that lupin and uh, will definitely move to the higher uh, For, you know line of therapy and then now there is a gap in uh, the older molecules and cadilla is now winning tenders looking at the older molecules because which is uh, uh, you know uh, like africa and uh, especially the markets like cambodia and the central asia where there, there is a prevalence of uh, tb there is no first line therapy and so we are in cashing on by winning tenders of who and un for these markets so you have to understand where is the gap you have to understand where the market is drifting and how you can position your r&d initiatives accordingly uh mark uh, let us uh, uh, learn this this is a very beautiful case study of fosamex uh, alentronic uh, and this is one of my uh, favorite case study and uh, and this if i uh, have to say this case study classifies for the new product which is uh, which we understand is go for gold uh, so this alentronate they introduced uh, in uh, first in europe 
then introduced the product in uh, US. And this was probably the one uh, first class bisphosphonase, which was now uh, later on added by solindronic acids, molecules like ibandronate, solindronic acids and all. Uh, the problem was uh, the prevalence. Uh, uh, so the product was launched for osteoporosis, uh, post in class drug. However, the product, when it was launched, it was not being regarded as a successful product because there was no diagnosis of this uh, osteoporosis. So if uh, on a lighter side, if you guys have seen the uh, finest movies of Will Smith, Pursuit of Happiness, the guy used to carry this uh, diagnostic device. This is actually a machine which used to measure and the cost of, uh, of that diagnosis was $200, $300 per test. So it had a repulsive behavior from uh, uh, the patients and from the doctors looking at the cost of diagnosis and then the cost of drug, uh, which was not uh, allowing, uh, you know, so uh, Merck at that point in time was a little uh, in, on our back foot saying that what had happened to their study. They did not study the market and, and they addresses the unmet need which is, was available for in terms of the therapy, but they could not address, uh, you know, accessibility of their drug. So what they did is uh, they had a they did they created a team, had a group discussion, understand how now uh, what could be their plan for it. So the business objective which they created is for more prescription, the more scans, more diagnosis has to happen, and the price of bone scans have to be. Uh, gone down. But this is something which is out of their control because they are the uh, pharmaceutical company, not into the medical devices primarily. That was not their forte. Now, what they created is a very fantastic thing. Uh, they created a new condition which was called as osteopenia. So they uh, worked with KOLs. They uh, uh, understand the therapy, they work with doctors extensively, and then they pick up a word called osteopenia. Now, what is osteopenia? Osteopenia is where the bones become weaker than the normal, but they don't break easily. So it's between osteoporosis and uh, uh, your fracture, there's they, they a condition called osteopenia. And then they worked on it. The more completely transformed, it's really heard word into diagnosis where actually the patient's uh, uh, pool was very huge. So what they said is uh, osteoporosis is one condition. However, to delay your progression towards osteoporosis is something which they are looking at. So they created a first ever NGO for uh, which worked with Bone Measurement Institute. They worked on uh, machines uh, also wherein they used to do the scannings of different types of bones and forearm, heel, wrist, fingers. They partner with the equipment manufacturers. However, the most important thing which they did is this, they did a strategic lobbying at FDA level. They said they did certain trials uh, to back their thought process. They worked through doctors and they, they worked in, in, in a consensus that, uh, in a way, which created a new indication altogether. And that's where uh, the birth of uh, the disease uh, marketing came in. They also worked on their formulation, understand that their current product would not uh, address the completely to the osteopenia because it was indicated for osteoporosis. They worked on a different formulations and they understand that there is a, another condition which now the bisphosphonates are known for is postmenopausal osteoporosis. They also worked on an indication what causes osteoporosis, glucocorticoids induced osteoporosis. So the outcome was the Medicare, which is one of the reimbursed program in US, the scanning van went up from 77,000 to 1.5 million. The bone centers increased from the existing in 95 from 2000 to 75,000. The cost of test, which was earlier 200 to 300. And the foursome X sales grew up from 1 billion in 99, 2 billion in 2002, 3 billion in 2004. And look at the new indications. Uh, PMO intervention, which is an osteopenia, which is postmenopausal 
causal osteoporosis for women. Glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, the different uh, SKUs they have, male osteoporosis. They worked, they carried on uh, their uh, RD initiatives, introduced once weekly for SMAX and the combinations vitamin D. So they, they didn't came out, uh, you know, uh, frustrated from that nothing is happening at one point of st uh, stage where when they launched Alandronade for SMAX. They worked extensively on it, understood the science behind it, understood the whole therapy behind it, and try to create what we say. Uh, meeting the treatment algorithm, you know, addressing the treatment algorithm. Learnings from it, identify unmet needs and the shape market around them. They understood the, what happens in osteoporosis, how it happens and how you can delay it. And came up with osteopenia. Begin market shaping activity. Then most effective uh, uh, companies begin shaping market during clinical, we all know, Involve and engage as many stakeholders as possible, raising awareness. And that is something which is most important aspect, uh, which most of the companies miss and is the key to success. And go beyond conventional partnership in meeting needs. Expand indication, develop new formulations. And one of the most important thing, if you look at the uh, US and European market, when you expand the indications, there is a market exclusivity which is given to you. So for example, if you have pediatric, uh, you have a product which is now indicated for pediatrics, you'll get an exclusivity of three months. There is a new, for new indication, there is a market exclusivity which is given. So they expand it and keep the competitions on a toes and, you know, shape the market. Coming in, I think uh, I'm, I'm uh, clear with uh, the case studies. Uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. Above, I would like to just, you know, add, I think Cadilla has a very uh, important, you have this Calcirol. Right? Yeah. Again, yes. Calcirol. Calcirol is again a you know, leader in India also. So Correct. Uh, the, the, the kind of formulation with the granules, uh, which they came out, it was a new thing which came out into the Indian market also. Correct. And, and, and uh, in uh, LG, I'll to compliment my, uh, uh, you know, presence in uh, the orthopedic segment with human growth hormone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's how you build up a, uh, your product portfolio. So yeah. Calcirol definitely is one of the greatest example of that. Right. Uh, I think I'm only short with uh, 15 minutes. I'll wrap it up. One of no, the problem. Few no, problem. no problem. No problem. Take a few skips, few. Ranitidine is one of the greatest example uh, I want to touch upon. Uh, even if uh, you look at Asilok, which is Cadillac's biggest brand, 400 crores, and we are the number one leaders in it. So this is something which is close to my heart, uh, and I want to take you how they differentiated it. So Glaxo, that in very, very old case study, uh, Glaxo launched this, Zantac was launched, uh, became second largest company in the world. Earlier, the product was Smith Klein. This product was launched of, of a lot of case, uh, studies into the market. However, there was not many differentiation which was there in the market. The product was first launched in Europe and then later on was added uh, in US because it does not offer a lot of potential uh, differentiation. Some benefits over Simitidine, which was well entrenched into the market and it was a leader and even you can find now in many of the uh, uh, pharmacy stores in US and Europe. It was uh, twice daily dosing against the four times and less of the side effects. Clearly no uh, differentiation. Glaxo at that point in time, they understood that their marketing uh, is something which there's not, uh, they don't have a forte, especially in the US. Uh, earlier they went to US. They were primarily a European company. They launched, uh, they came up with a Roche in the co-promotion agreement for this. They built up of its own field force at the cost of Roche uh, to launch this product. Zantec's strategy was uh, to show any efficacy benefits of the Simitidine, focus on a safety part. They price it only 20% over the Tegamet, which was first in class drug. Uh, and there's something which is uh, not unheard uh, at that point in time. You know, you generally place your product at a very premium price, they just only place it 20% premium over the tech. Now look at 
uh, Tegamet was well entrenched. Uh, they could not see the sales of renitrin, which is happening. What they did, unique uh, Glaxo, is they studied the market. They had their medical team. They worked what is happening, what is not happening. They could understand that there is in certain. Uh, Tegamet was a product for heartburn, so they understood the condition. They and it was more of an OTC product. So if you have a heartburn, you take Tegamet and it's over. They worked on the condition. They created a condition called GRD, gastroesophageal distant disease. And they worked on it and proved to the FDA. They went to FDA saying that it's a chronic disorder. If it's uh, so uh, more you have a heartburn, so it will have a long-term effect on your uh, uh, general body metabolism. And they said it does not warrant any RX. So, so you don't need an OTC treatment out of it. You need a, a proper prescriptions, and it has to go through GPs and specialities. And that's how they differentiated from Tegamet. Glaxo created an institute called Institute of Digestive Health, which further equated GRD with a serious consequence. So, from an a product from acid neutralizer. They built up a product which is now an acid blocker, and it accounts. So it was first drug in the in the history which crosses one billion, and first ever drug to cross four billion dollars. So, so you know, in generally, yeah, it's very easy from a, a product which is in prescriptions, and then you want to go to an OTC if your segment is very. So they created a condition. They changed the paradigm, saying that uh, you know uh, a uniqueness in their product. However, the product was not differentiated against simetidine. Just the, some compliance they were offering. They studied on a uh, molecule in terms of the therapy, and then they built on the therapy, saying that that's the place where they want to uh, place their product. And rest is the history. So. Uh, just in a nutshell, I want to uh, share market opportunity analysis, how you do step by step uh, on what my learnings to the case studies, analyze the existing market. That's what we do. Generally, directly competing the market, list out existing number of competitors, top three competitors, fastest going on, build on your strengths. And that's what we do in management. Uh, you know, we do a lot of SWOT analysis. We study the SWOT analysis. We have to do the SWOT analysis. Identify unmet need in existing market, non presence in subspecific, presence of competitors, what they do, what is the need to develop, identifying a concept development statement, and then evaluate new opportunity segments. Uh, do we have resources? Who all are companies' major strengths? Do I have a coverage? What is an unmet need? How am I satisfied? So, that's, these, these are the basic things which I think every company is doing. Uh, however, Looking at, uh, we should come over the uh, over what we are doing at this point in time and think how the other, especially the MNCs. I know they have the resources, they have a muscle power, they have a price, uh, the resources in terms of price, money, cost, everything. So you have to come over the uh, the basics of your operational works and think that you have to create something new. And things can happen. The people have break, uh, broken their silos. They have changed the paradigm and make the successful products as a marketing manager. Now look at this. Uh, just want to cross it and just want to finish it. Look at the certain uh, words. Panic disorders, reflex disease, erectile dysfunctions, bipolar disorders, overreactive bladder. So these are the words uh, which are not the indications earlier. These are the indications which have been quoted by the uh, international players. And this is something which we now call as a disease branding. So the strategic approach, which we say is elevating importance, redefining current condition. Because uh, if I take an example of uh, alteridine, Detrol, uh, the product from uh, Pfizer, the product was approved by uh, for the indication called urge incontinence. So most of the people were uh, having this. Uh, epidemiology says seventeen percent of Americans had this, but they, it has a uh, social stigma attached to it. Nobody could say it, go to a doctor saying that I have an urge incontinence. So they created a condition called overreactive bladder. 
which sees the uh, increase in the population, the reach of a drug, and thus created a new segment out of it. GRD indication for GSK, which I've seen. Uh, Paroxetine, panic disorders. So if you look into the CMS market, it's the most uh, competitive market. Uh, GSK work on it, created a new condition called panic disorder. Zoloft, post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are the, so look at the companies are working at therapy level and that's how we differentiate our pharmaceutical industry from a commodity industry. We are not FMCG. We are looking, we are science oriented industry. So we, the companies spend dollars on you know, understanding the science and then creating a niche out of it. The recent examples, Floxetine, which I am, uh, I have also launched in one of, in my international market in the condition called premenstrual diasporic disorder. Even I have to explain to my customer that, you know, Floxetine, let's not go through a generic way. This is a special niche indication, which we can trigger, which we can create out of it. That's all. Uh, uh, this is a case study of Janubi. I think I'm a little short with the time. Uh, Weber, uh, we don't have any problem. Weber, uh, please, okay. you, yeah, you can please take your time. This is a, it is going on live. So we don't have any time constraints. So even if you have, you know, it's, it's okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So, uh, these are the conditions. Uh, I mean, examples from, uh, little past. However, I want to also share one of the recent example and how the company has launched the product thinking on, uh, you know, a very well devised strategy uh, to capture the market. And uh, I was very fortunate that I joined the industry at that point in time and worked on uh, and seen uh, this uh, market shaping up and worked on new of the molecules in this category. So, it was Januvia, uh, the first class diabetes drug. The product was, uh, we all know, it's cetagliptin, crossed 1 billion mark in the second year of launch. Uh, we all know uh, this product. Now, what? Uh, how do we define it as a case study? I, I look at it from a point of view that if one has to optimize and make their operations efficient to have a successful launch uh, is uh, we have to go through this case study on how to make a successful launch in terms of your operational effectiveness from a point of view of how your different uh, departments work in cohesiveness to make a launch successful and how you work uh, on your product to create something which was never happened and create, uh, you know, keep your competition out of uh, your domain as much as you can. So this is a case study, which we can uh, give us all the answers to this. And it's very thought provoking. Uh, so we all know anti-diabetes uh, segment is one of the largest. We are the diabetes capital. And uh, when I was in Panacea, we were developing a newer DPP-4 inhibitor. And that was something which gave me a job in LG Life Sciences too. Uh, when we, uh, I got fortunate to work on another class of uh, DPP-4, which is now being replaced by uh, SGLT2. But however, the 10 years was of DPP-4 inhibitor and now they're deeply entrenched in even in the Indian market. Luck also favored them. Uh, so there were two molecules which was developed. One was from uh, was cetagliptin, uh, Genuvia, and saxagliptin, which is from Novartis, which was vildagliptin. Uh, saxagliptin was uh, uh, ahead of Genuvia. However, it was twice a day, do day dosing. Uh, Genuvia uh, was little on a, uh, they were laggards in terms of the clinical data which they were developing. Saxagliptin went into, uh, when they filed to the FDA, FDA uh, correlated, uh, so there is a rule, uh, I would say, and even I have learned that, that if you have a, a diabetic drug, because it's a chron for chronic indication and CVS is an indication which is looked at once at together. So you also need to have a safety data on the 
heart patients for the cardio problems also because it has a correlation to the overall uh, cvs segment so saxa gripped him went into the troubles and thereby genuvia got their approval before saxa gripped him so they enjoyed what we say a new chemical entity uh, nc exclusivity which was for the 3 years and they could keep the newer molecules at a bay the dif differentiation over the current agents was similar efficacy profile but better safety profile compared with the age it was first in class uh, launch speed was the key factor so if you look at the average uh, years in r and d for a, a particular molecule it takes now average in 1990 to 99 was 14 years genuvia citagliptin which was first dpp4 inhibitor it was developed discovered everything was in 3.8 years the uniqueness was uh, they adopted a multifaceted marketing campaign uh, now at what do we mean by multifaceted at different level different marketing channels were opened and different way of promoting a drug was adopted by the company which was unique because it was a new molecule and new class of drug which was launched so the company went all the way to establish this molecule what was the secret sauce behind uh, this uh, look at this speed to market when i was saying within 24 hours of approval thought leaders kwls uh, begin delivering the talks they so what happened in past is they associated all the thought leaders kwls and when i was working with the uh, pharma uh, we also i could recollect that we were working on uh, genuvia as a molecule where uh, that time i was not aware of it but you know we were calling doctors and making them that you know uh, there is a new drug which is coming and because the drug name was blinded by the client and we were calling doctors that this is the uh, uh, mechanism of action will you prescribe such product so they were associated and we were one of the consulting company which was part of it there were a lot of companies which uh, do such so they work with leaders kwells engage them so that they are well aware of what is a new molecule which is coming so once the product is out you have your prescriber base ready within 48 hours of the launch the education forums the sales representative the webcast to the health world provide everything was ready 90 minutes functional website 8 days market mark reached 70% of the target doctors and made uh, you know the product delivered at a pharmacy at every pharmacy within 14 days the mock complete discussions with mcos which are major uh, prescribers in terms of uh, the medical communities covering 188 million patients is 73% of the total target market it was launched in 81 countries within 4 years of approval of the us launch so what it means if they were not working only on the us market only on the europe market uh, which saxa gliptin uh, was working they worked closely and introducing the same molecule across the nation so what happens in international market the most of the companies they work first for the us and europe and then took it to the different markets this company mark they worked on this us market the ua european and start working on introducing the other molecules uh, the same molecule in other markets also uh very important question uh, thing was so just move yeah, there were some lot of questions which are coming and i'm eager to answer those uh, right from the day one they realized the success will depend depend on an early usage the first line of treatment uh, so if you look at to the treatment algorithm of uh, diabetes much form you cannot replace it because it's a gold standard for even today metformin is the gold standard in diabetic and the diabetic market if you look, even look at companies small companies like granules uh they are the largest suppliers of metformin in us uh and their 70 60% of revenue comes from a single molecule which is metformin the success is you cannot replace metformin you need a drug you can 
complement metformin uh, so that you can place your product accordingly. However, there are certain other products like sulfonyl ureas, EZs, which you can replace. To, so what life cycle management they did in terms of uh, cetagliptin, 2006, uh, the product was launched in US, 2007 in Europe. Genumet is cetagliptin plus metformin. They introduced this product in US. So a moment they realized they start, they, back end they were working on the combination because a lot of market research says that in absence of metformin, your product would not sell in. And that's how most of the combinations, they work with metformin. They introduce a product a year later, Genomate, which is cetagliptin plus metformin. They also worked uh, earlier with, on a molecule called Genomate XR, which is the sustained release, which keeps your product under the AUC level for maximum time. So what they did is they started narrowing their product portfolio. They started now, you know, uh, working on creating a solution for all the line of therapies, treatment algorithm uh, for anti-diabetics. So for the first phase, they add on metformin. So Genumet answers the replacement of sulfonyl ureas. In second phase, you add on sulfonyl ureas with or without metformin. You have uh, plain genuvia answering the second line. In third phase, you add on insulin. They had a study uh, with against insulin. They had a study with BPRs and metformin. And that's where Genumit uh, XR come into play. So they have the answers for all the sec line of treatments that were available. Few uh, learnings from uh, it was the emphasis on education, the unique uh, mode of action for DPP-4 inhibitors, which differentiated from the other class of molecule, which were well established. Uh, they used technology, uh, video detailing, tablet PCs. That was something which uh, uh, were known. Post-approval promotion. They engaged KVLs, celebrities, direct-to-customer advertising, global advertising, Salesforce. I am not aware of this is hap that happened in India. However, probably this may happen in US and European markets. The Merck partnership with Siemens, and that was something which was unique. Uh, they partnered with Siemens uh, to identify the patient pool because they want they know that the incidence and the prevalence rate of the condition is very high. However, the diagnosis holds the key. More you add on the patients uh, from the diagnosis pool, your customer base increases. And that's point they realized they partnered with Siemens to launch point of care uh, within offices for HbA1c technology for efficient management. One uh, point in uh, which, uh, you know, when I was going through this case study uh, struck me is the multi-channel marketing. They invested in both traditional and digital, and that's where they differentiated and placed the product quite well in the market. It has been rightly called as a first class strategy for the first in class drug. This comes uh, to a very interesting topic. What is the life cycle management? Uh, and so uh, one case study I could realize uh, uh, and I worked on it quite extensively uh, when I was in Jubilant because Jubilant is one of the premier company who has a uniqueness in selling isomiprazole. So one of the case study I just want to take upon on the life cycle management, uh, learning from Genuvia, wherein they had a life cycle management from Genuvia to Genumet to Genumet XR, addressing the all needs. So one of the another interesting case study I want to touch upon is uh, Prilosec, which is Omiprazole, was one of the PPIs successfully launched, no generics, uh, even uh, near when the product was near to the patent expiry. Uh, however, once uh, the product was near to pay, uh, patent expiry, the team, AstraZeneca, uh, they thought that, you know, uh, how to keep this product moving. And 
since we have tasted a lot of success on this uh, uh, and we have a deep entrenchment in this segment how to make uh, uh, you know continue the legacy of omiprazole and that's where uh, you know uh, the new molecule came in uh, uh, however one more point i want to make here is they did a market research on omiprazole and then they understand that 50% of the patient was satisfied which was like music to their ears uh, so they want to carry on the legacy of omiprazole omipriz uh, because it was very really successful in terms of the revenues it fetched in terms of the patient satisfaction and uh, looking at the molecules and the base of a market so they were looking at you know how to carry on its legacy and that's where the new molecule came in isomiprazole which lack most of the uh, differentiating points however uh, look at how successfully astrazeneca played with, uh, with the, both the molecules together in their product basket uh, the key differentiation is uh, isomiprazole is just an, an active isomer different isomer uh, which offers certain uniqueness in terms of a better safety profile however when you look into the manufacturing aspect of this molecule this uh, molecule is developed through a unique technology called smegs and uh, when i was in jubilant i encountered you know a uh, lot of learning in terms of how it is developed and that's where jubilant uh, sells most of the api for isomiprazole it's difficult to make it's not easy uh, smegs means self uh, microemulsifying uh, technology so this isomiprazole is developed through this which offers you know a, a, a kind of a uniqueness in terms of giving market exclusivity over manufacturing patent and also offers a, a high barrier in terms of replicating this molecule from an api and from the formulation point of view differentiation is in as i told you is an active isomers what unique they did is uh, astrazeneca they came up with a new indication called erosive esophagitis which means uh, acid induced damage to your esophagus though when they compared both the drugs isomiprazole with omiprazole it's only a marginal improvement in the healing rate from isomiprazole versus the omiprazole however this 3% of the marginal difference they in cash and they created a marketing strategy to cover the different target audience altogether what they did is uh, the tagline uh, which uh, uh, i still remember was when the heart burn is so severe that it eroded esophagus you need a better healing rate so what they did is uh, they created both the products omiprazole was moved into the otc segment and isomiprazole was more into the prescribing segment however the uniqueness of they carried on the legacy of omiprazole which was known as a purple pill giving it uh, the same legacy to both the doctors and both the prescribers and both the customer base with this they also included certain uh, which i told you about manufacturing exclusive they also did a pediatric exclusivity which gives them a little more edge uh, increasing its customer base to the pediatrics also they promoted uh, the promotion to the physicians astrazeneca detail uh, you know 6000 medical detailers for nine products nexium received so you look at how they changed uh, you know keeping the price of both the products even the uh, isomiprazole a little lower so that you know uh, when the generics come in they could keep them at a competition uh, with isomiprazole which is a new molecule which is uh, and then they shifted the prescriber base from omiprazole to isomiprazole because they knew the competition would come in the generics in us mostly from the indian companies would take away their market share so by the time the generics came in they had a tough time you know from the prescriber because because now they have moved to a better perceived molecule which offers them a better perceived safety profile and also a product 
at a similar price at the com as generics and that's how uh, the uniqueness uh, which brings on uh, the success of isomiprazole after the patent expiry of imiprazole certain uh, otc switch which uh, i talked about was a master stroke which uh, they they partnered with procter and gamble uh, they placed omiprazoles as an otc uh, otc version rising less than a dollar pill consumer base uh, they did a 100 million dollars marketing campaign so this marketing campaign they did it for uh, omiprazole which in in a way was helping more of uh, isomiprazole also because both the because they always keep this in the customer mind that isomiprazole have a better healing rate than omiprazole now look at the preparation the fleet of uh, 1200 trucks was kept ready to deliver otc to hit maximum minute to past midnight once the patent was expired all this so i hope uh, uh, you've gone through the case studies so from the case studies few of the learnings uh, which uh, is uh, uh, which i want to pen down one was widen the customer base you look at you have look at how omiprazole have widened their customer base isomiprazole by adding on pediatric exclusivity how they widen their customers increase call frequency from sales uh, force to top prescribing doctors that was one of the key feature which uh, they spend uh, was promotion to the physicians they increased because it's a new product you have to detail out Uh, aggressively, and once you want to change from a one perceived benefit to the another person, you have to increase your uh, top of mind recall to from a doctor. New uses uh, of the product, add flanking products to the line extension in the same therapeutic area. Like uh, if you have uh, from from the finest example which we have, vanadine, you want to add on uh, new products as a line extension. Add on a new uh differentiated what we say uh category creators okay stand out from the crowd add a little differentiated uh, differentiation to your product cross functional teamwork was uh, more, one of the most important thing uh which we have seen uh, as a base to the success of genuvia we have seen as a base of success from astrazeneca when they could uh you know flawlessly shifted the prescriber base from uh, from omiprazole to isomiprazole placed omiprazole best as an otc product and alex to otc and otc to alex which that is something which a lot of companies are looking at even when i am uh, now in international business if i see a lot of products in india uh, of indian which are in prescribing uh mode in india uh you know precisely in rx category in africa they are notc so you play on those rx and notc switch based on the uh, competency you have uh, of your sales team based on the channel strengths you have which i talked about that's all from my side i think uh, six seven case studies uh, from across uh, the segments wherein uh, which the objective was to make a uh, little more uh, thought provoking wherein uh, even if we can think on those lines uh, though these are from the multinationals but even if certain aspects we can touch upon when uh, we work in our day to day routine i think we can make a uh, successful uh, careers ahead that was great you know uh, it was you know very very insightful and you know the kind of case studies what you discussed you know the whole idea is uh, you know we when we enter into the pharmaceutical business and if we you know uh, keep this attitude of learning so that that is the that is the thing what the industry expects from us and you know i i always uh, you know uh, share this thing that learning never takes place in air conditioned rooms so you know the field is very important so when i used to work in i uh, as a territory business executive my product manager you know always you know told me that sort of any information you have in the field just share so i used to share this information with my product manager 
and these uh, case studies arise from the in inquisitiveness and the you know the uh, how how depth you have in the field so thank you uh, weber uh, so we can you know quick uh, quickly take a uh, few questions right so okay. i'll just uh, go through some important so we have uh, what is there is one question one what is sustainable different analysis i'm not getting this question what is sustainable different analysis so basically uh, from sustainable is basically what i was trying to make a point is that positioning when you create a position in mind of customer mm -hmm. and especially when you are in uh, pharmaceutical field the positioning which you want to create in doctor's mind or the customer mind has to be sustainable it should not be that uh, you work on uh, so so that's how we differentiate from uh, ourselves when we are in pharmaceutical industry right that you cannot change your stand again and again so if as a brand manager if my communication is uh, saying that i have a differentiation i address to this part of your treatment algorithm i should stick on to it and complement it with the various studies which are there for example i should do some user trial i should build on certain clinical studies uh, i should build on certain bibliographic data and try to complement it so that you know it should not because doctor is something who is using and is more learned than you however when he has learned uh, he must have learned in 10 years back so you have to right play with his mind create your own position and then build on to that communication over and over so that it should be placed as what you think in the doctor's mind for example when uh, we say uh, you know uh, in case studies ranitidine uh, you know so the communication was year long genuvia so they did the case uh, the clinical research they build on to the clinical studies okay so you built on to your product add on to this uh, saying that it's not the uniqueness in your packaging which gives you a uh, uh, a market share it has to be the communication for example right. when you are placing your product in a new indication so the companies have worked on what is called a disease positioning mm -hmm. so when doctors doctor must have studied these indication may not be there so like urge incontinence to overreactive bladder the doctor was not aware especially when when you uh, when the most of the drugs are being developed in us so you are not aware of for example dpp4 inhibitors when i was working on it and i used to talk to doctors they were saying that oh come on guys i don't know this uh, mechanism of action and it's not the story does not end here you have dpp4 inhibitors then you have sglt2 inhibitors right. coming right. along so you have to build on to your communication has your communication has to be sustainable and it's not you should not look into the short term gains you should look into the long term gains so that right. the doctor is with you for long right right uh there is there are questions but i am taking only relevant questions uh, there is a question that hello sir what kind of market research companies perform before launching a new product into the indian market and what are the sales and the marketing strategies for the new products i think you have already covered this point but if you want to what kind of market research companies perform before launching new products in the indian market so uh, so uh, it was uh, so different companies uh, if you talk about the multinationals uh, they spend years they spend dollars working on market research primarily ranging from the secondary market research to the uh, primary market research when i was in an intern when i uh, went to pharma uh, for my sub summer training i did my summer training in competitive intelligence so so i was associated with bollinger ringelem and they were developing a lot of uh, new maps for products like for the indications in rheumatoid arthritis cancers and all so they used to do market research only in what you know so even so maps are so if any cancer molecule if you look into it it's range from a different uh, 
uh, indications in cancer. So every product would have seven to eight indications attached to it, addressing different needs in the different uh, uh, part, you know, part of cancers or type of cancers. So you have to build on what others are doing. Some companies, what they do is uh, they do a market research in terms of if you have a product, for example, I'm recently launching a probiotics uh, in my Southeast Asian market. So in uh, when I'm launching it, what strains are available? Mm -hmm. What unmet need I would be uh, addressing it? And from a regulatory, which Dr. Saurabh, you mentioned in international business, one of the major arm is regulatory. Exactly. So are, dev, uh, are registered in those countries. For example, I was very shocked. So my product is Lactobacillus GG, which is a new strain. DRL is about to launch in India. However, when I'm trying to launch certain kind of products in Myanmar, the strain is not developed. Correctly. So the, the, the regulators don't know even this strain. For now, for I have to convince the regulators that it's a safe strain. For them, it's like a new biological in their region. Though the product is indicated for uh, diarrhea, constipations, and all those. Right. But they are not receptive for this new product. So you have to understand, you have to drill down to the primary market research, talk to the doctors, do the secondary research, do the research on a regulatory platform, which uh, Dr. Sarab, you write. Yes, 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 yes. Do the research on an IP platform, you know, when the patent is expiring, you cannot. There may be certain products wherein uh, you think it's a novel. They may may or may not have launched, but there are certain patents which might be uh, holding up. So you have to do the research at a different platform and at a different levels. That's that's why you know this consulting sector has grown like anything. You know you see you see how much of you know uh, in depth uh, IQVR then you know ZS. How much WNS Global? How much you know? Uh, how much depth they put into the this kind of thing and the kind of so you have to you know perform on the both the secondary and the primary research and without the knowing the intricacies of the market, if you go you know the so you might not get success. It's very true, sir. Uh, we, we are taking one more question. So there is a question that if we launch a product and it achieves a good sale in its first year. And if we want to refill the pipeline and then what's the correct time that we should start looking for new molecular product to refill the pipeline of a product? Correct. Uh, this is a very good question in terms of uh, not I know the answer. It's because this is something uh, uh, every brand manager, every, uh, every business head always struggle with. Um, yes. And so uh, for uh, marketing your product. For example, if it's a branded market or it's a generic market. If it's a generic market, my experience and what my I've seen is basically your product would be uh, uh, looking at the price wars. Three years, mm -hmm. you're looking at where you can compete, fetch the revenues, mm -hmm. uh, do uh, your wonders. However, if you're looking at branded generic space, and that's where uh, the competencies of uh, brand managers, marketing managers come in to play. Uh, you have to look into the competition first and what is your uniqueness in all you cannot what i have mentioned uh, in one of my wherein i was descri uh, describing on positioning you cannot beat everyone right. and you cannot uh, be over and above you cannot take head on with everyone in the market so i'll take it as uh, for example I have a very fantastic molecule uh, in India, Aciloc, as in from Cadillac. So Aciloc uh, is a molecule, age old, done wonders, one of the top 25 product uh, brands in India. However, the product uh, recently, the guidelines have changed. So what we have done, uh, so this, the history, if I take on take Aciloc is a special uh, strategic business unit, which handles it and very close to promoter's heart. We have Aciloc, uh, we have Aciloc extended release, we have Aciloc injection. So we have done all the permutation combination in terms of a portfolio mix, which we could do catering to the different markets uh, and doctors segments and the customer needs. We were first one to introduce Aciloc injections in an indication wherein, which called uh, when uh, there's a surgery happening and there's an acid reflux, which happens. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You also need an injectable. So we were the first one. We were the innovators in introducing uh, the same molecule. However, what happened in the market is uh, one fine day, GSK Products, which is uh, Gentac, they were evaluating and they found out uh, NDMA issue in the molecule. Now, what is NDMA issue? Uh, so there is certain impurities in the API mm-hmm. which are carcinogenic in their nature. Mm. Now, GSK as one of the uh, ethical company and uh, they withdrew the product. Now this US FDA guidelines came into the other markets because most of the markets, they took US as a, their reference country. Mm. So it percolates down to India and a lot of companies, they have to withdraw their products. They have to stop. So it came to a Cadilla also. So what happened is overnight our 400 crores franchise uh, is under you know uh, trouble we were clueless what to do because there's certain new thing which has came in and that's the uniqueness of pharmaceutical industry you that's cannot right. say that i'm a marketing guy i should not understand the regulatory i should not understand the therapies i should not and that is what is uniqueness even ihmr brings in because it, if you look at the curriculum uh, we should we as a student we were never taught only the marketing man management right. and that's differentiate right. ourselves from other management institutes we were also talked about regulatory we also talked about uh, the biology behind supply it. chain and all is very important right so uh, and then that's where we worked on so we worked we worked start right from the apis look at the ndma limits look at what all the impurities can we differentiate can we change now in in a, in a pharmaceutical industry, if there is an even a minutest thing which change you change in your formulation, right? You have to report back to the agencies saying right. that, and then you have to prove that it's safe. It's a highly regulated market. It's a highly and regulated. Yes, and uh, we survived in that market. Right. However, right. there were restrictions to my other portfolio, saying that I cannot uh, market my IV formulation now because it goes directly into the bloodstream and it's a, it has a high absorption, but I would, uh, got an approval to market my tablets. So exactly. markets like Philippines, I could market, but not markets like Vietnam, not markets like uh, Korea. So we stopped market. So the question is when to introduce a new product, when not to introduce a new product, it basically we as a marketing guys, we as a product owners, product managers, we have to go and look at the market dynamics. Right. Where the market is shifting. It may be that you don't want to introduce a new portfolio uh, in terms of differentiating your own product. You, you, there would be a requirement wherein you should look at, you know, a new molecule altogether. So, for example, a part uh, what Sarabhai lost. Where Sarabhai lost. Sarabhai was focused on narrow spectrum and antibiotics. They thought that, you know, come on guys, these are my, uh, I'm the market leader. I drive the market, but Renbaxi, Alchem, they picked up, you know, the broad anti back anti spectrum. And even they, these companies got a hit when the right. uh, era of FPCs came in, you know, mixing right. one product with the others, which now is being stopped and tightly being governed by Indian regulators. So you have to understand the dynamics of the industry, right. you have to understand where the market is flowing. And that only comes when you do a market research, you be associated with a, uh, your customers, be associated with the market leaders, attend the forums, do activities and swallow your hand in the market, be on right. the market. Right, right, right. Weber, uh, uh, I think we have some few questions left, but I think majority of the relevant questions we have answered. and. May I request the other people to whom we cannot answer uh, kindly email uh, your questions and we'll definitely respond to your uh, questions. So uh, already we are, you know, now 1, 1 p.m. Weber, uh, it was a great learning, you know, listening to you. Uh, you brought in, you know, law, your experience, you know, whole experience today and uh, discuss the case studies in a very, very, you know, um, enjoyable way. And I, I hope the audience, you know, uh, uh, they liked it and uh, it's, it was very, very, you know, informative uh, to me and the audience. Thank you for sharing these, you know, life. These are the 
rare you know chances because you don't get these opportunities where you get the people you have actually worked in this area and you shared these things so it was uh, i i thank you on behalf of school of pharmaceutical management the participants for taking the pains uh, sharing so insightful you know um, information with us it was a great it was a pleasure and honor uh, to have you with us and uh, we keep on you know looking forward for your uh, regular interactions with us Uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Anything you would like to share, Rebo? Pleasure is mine, sir. These are certain uh, few case studies which I can draw. This is my experience. The, there is no limit to the learning. I'm still a learning. I'm right. still a student of IHMR, learning mm -hmm. from uh, you all, esteemed professors, uh, right. and uh, would like to share what whenever it comes my way. Uh, would like to share experience because that helps me a lot also. It was, that helps it, me yeah. in improving my skills and uh, moving forward. Thanks for giving thank me this support. Thank you, thank you, Weber. Thank you once again for uh, today. You know, it's Sunday. Uh, I know uh, <laughs> it's a, a hol holiday for, but you spared your you know time and uh, your taking took so much of pains for preparing the presentation and discussing these things. So once again, many many thanks uh, from us. So with this one, we conclude this webinar and thank you all the participants for joining us. Thank you, Weber, for coming you. and uh, joining. Have a nice day. Enjoy okay. your Sunday. Thank you so much. for. Thank okay, you. sir. Bye -bye. Stay safe, stay healthy. Stay Bye -bye. safe. Thank you so much. Thank you.